Thanks, Hugo, and thanks everyone for staying back to the very last session. Uh, so uh, that's a long title. The short title for the talk is uh, Cryptographic Agents, which is the name for the framework I'm going to talk about. This is based on joint works with uh, Shashank, Shweta, and Tsinghua. Uh, Shweta is at IIT Delhi, and the others, the rest of us are at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. OK, so you know, these are exciting times. That's what this workshop has all been about. A lot of new primitives have come up in the you know, last few years. IBE, FE, FHE, obfuscation, and so forth, or multilinear maps. Uh, that's all nice, but that also means there's a lot of um, uh, you know, a lot of things that have come up that we don't know much about. Of course, we, you know, there are a lot of assumptions, hardness questions that you know we don't know much about. You saw Amit's gardens with you know new kinds of seeds there, but also these objects you know that are, uh, that we are building. Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about what is the right way to define them. And just as an illustration, something like functional encryption, you would find a large number of uh, definitions out there. And further, it's not just that you know, there are many definitions for one primitive, but also there are different flavors of the same or similar primitives, right? Um, you have uh, FE with function hiding, without function hiding. You can have symmetry key, public key, you can have public index, private index. So there's a you know, whole zoo of things, or maybe you some it's. Uh, but there's a whole garden of these things. It's a more humane way of uh, <laughs> treating our uh, treating our primitives. Uh, so there's a you know, whole garden of these things, and uh, you know we'd like to do some uh, we'd like to do, do some botany, uh, understand <laughs> them, right? So do we need all these different definitions? Do, are they so different from each other? Could we have uh, you know, and how can we study them uh, in one framework? Okay, and I'm speculating that maybe this was how it was in the 80s. Ron can correct me if it's not. Uh, I'm just you know, imagining. Uh, you know, all these things came about, right? Oblivious transfer, coin flipping over the telephone, zero knowledge proofs, uh, secure function evaluation, more general MPC. And you know, they were all very different things when they came out. But over time, you know, now we think of these things just as MPC. Um, and even for you know, say something like public key encryption, when RSA came about, we didn't have formal definition. The definitions came later. You know, constructions came first. And maybe for these things like you know, obfuscation and uh, functional encryption, we are in a similar setting now. There are a lot of interesting, exciting constructions out there. Uh, maybe we should also now look at the definitions a little more closely. And I don't mean to you know, say this will be the definition that we will need. Uh, even with something like universal composition, you know, UC security, which is a very broad framework, it doesn't tr really ca try to capture everything out there. Right? There are useful things like, I don't know, statistics or knowledge or witness indistinguishable proofs. That doesn't necessarily fit inside this framework uh, cleanly, but still it's a very useful framework. Okay? So that's the spirit of uh, you know, uh, this work. Can we get a unifying framework for all these objects? It doesn't have to be exhaustively, you know, have to exhaustively cover everything, but still something um, you know, that'll, uh, that'll uh, tell us a lot about these primitives. Now, I'm going to skip over this kind of philosophical question of do we even need a framework? You know, it's in the same spirit as why UC is a useful thing. Okay? But I will uh, address this question. Do we need a new framework? Um, uh, like you all was uh, telling us uh, uh, in his, I think it was in the boot camp, and you know, MPC is so general you could capture everything. So, and we have very good frameworks for MPC. Could we just repurpose uh, an MPC framework and make it work for these objects? And that's a very fair question. But there are a few problems with that. Uh, one is that MPC frameworks tend to use simulation-based security, which is very good. It's a very strong security definition. But unfortunately, they tend to yield impossible to results for things like obfuscation or functional encryption, where it, you cannot simulate uh, an, an obfuscated program unless you can learn it. Right? Uh, also, they are geared towards MPC frameworks are geared towards protocols. And like Amit was uh, telling us earlier, again, I think in the boot camp, MPC and you know, these things like obfuscation are very different in flavor. In MPC, you could talk about the adversary is talking to an honest party or a, or a protocol. There is some you know, part of the uh, system that the adversary doesn't touch. And you could define things like an implicit 
input. You could extract out an implicit input. So even though there have been, uh, there has been the Michaeli Pass Rosen approach of defining um, security for MPC without using simulation, it relies on things like uh, an implicitly defined input. Whereas if you're giving an obfuscated program to an adversary, you know, the adversary is going to play with it, and there is no notion of which inputs did it evaluate this program on, right? Uh, so, you know, so we need something new, okay? Something which doesn't depend on simulation, doesn't depend on things like implicit input. So that's the that's plan. So we're going to give you one framework, uh, and within that framework, we'll try to capture a variety of objects. You could talk about public key encryption, functional encryption, FHE, obfuscation, even primitives like multilinear maps, and we call all these things schemas. There's like functionalities in the in the UC security framework, and for us, we call these things schemas, and just some name we came up with. Um, and okay, that's one object, but obviously there are different levels of security you could talk about for something like obfuscation, IO, DIO, public coin DIO. You know, they are not the same. So you do want to have the flexibility of defining different levels of security. And in our framework, that'll come about by defining different uh, families of what we call test. And when I show you the framework, it'll become clear what the test is. And in our framework, there will be, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, possibility of composition so that we can define reductions. And uh, if you have reductions, you can uh, you know, have compositions in our framework. There's a composition theorem. So I'll briefly talk about that. Um, and it's not just that we can capture known definitions. You know, once you develop a framework, things will fall out of it, whether you want it or not. So we'll end up getting new notions of you know, FE and obfuscation. And also, sometimes we can get some constructions. May not be the most exciting constructions, won't be you know, the uh, most uh, complicated um, you know, hybrids or anything. It'll be fairly simple, at least so far. Uh, but it'll still be interesting to see. You, know, you can get new constructions uh, for these new objects, sometimes assuming, making some very strong assumptions, like you know, if you had some pretty fancy obfuscation, which is not known to be impossible, you could get some pretty fancy version of something else. Okay, so you'll get. Simple, like it's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, no, simple is good, but the way it works is that, at least right now, to get the simplicity, we rely on stronger primitives, where we start from. So that's a bad thing. Um, and another interesting thing is that since all these things are now sitting in the same, uh, under the same umbrella, certain concepts which we might have studied for obfuscation, you can see that it translates to something for these other objects also. What exactly do they mean? You know, we might need to uh, look further. We are not, we haven't fully understood everything that falls out of the framework. And uh, even as we speak, we are working on an extension to the framework. I'll briefly talk about it at the very end of our time. Okay, so I'll jump right into the definition. It's very simple. Okay, so before you fall asleep, let me just get you, get to you these two, cup, you know, couple of slides, which will completely. Uh, mostly define the framework, uh, apart from some small details which I'm going to not get into. Okay, so it's a it's not a simulation-based definition, but there is a real world and ideal world. Um, and here is what the ideal world looks like. Okay, uh, so there is a test. You could think of it like an environment in a UC framework, and there is a user, and then there is an ideal black box, and what the test and the user can do is that they can upload what we call agents to the black box. Think of them as objects or programs. Um, and I'll have an example coming up shortly. So both of them can upload these agents, and the user can operate on them. The way it operates on agents is to you know, ask, so it gets handles for every agent that has been uploaded, and it can ask this black box, you know, can you make this agent talk to that agent and tell me what our output, uh, you know, it comes out of that interaction. So we allow sessions between these agents. So at this point, agents, you know, are uh, interactive Turing machines. They can talk to each other, but as we will see, there will be very simple interactions because they're not going to. This is the ideal world. Okay, so there'll there'll be very simple interaction. And in the real world, there is no trusted uh, center like this. So instead, what happens is whenever the test wants to upload an agent. It makes an object out of it. Okay, so I call it O. 
you know, objectifies uh, the, the agent and just hands it over to the user. The user needs to you know, use it so you know, to kind of evaluate, se you know, run sessions on it. And there's another algorithm for that, this E, which is to evaluate or execute. So it can execute the agent sessions and get whatever they want out of it. Okay? Uh, so that's the uh, real world. What is the, the interaction between the user and the test? Like, why is it there? Why can't okay. it? What's the difference between that and going Okay, good point. So we allow right now an arbitrary interaction between the test and the user. This is in the spirit of uh, the user influencing what gets uploaded, right? So the, say in encryption, you usually talk about the adversary specifying two messages or, uh, you know, yeah, in our case, it could be arbitrary interaction as of now. We will later restrict it as and when necessary, okay? If we want to send information from user towards test, Bottom line is the, only, the bottom arrow is the only way. Yeah. So right now, uh, in in this framework or throughout this talk, actually, uh, a, agents are upload. The test only uploads agents. It doesn't get anything back from this thing. So this arrow is intentionally one directional. Uh, that you know, we the goal is to have a very minimalist uh, pr uh, framework that is enough to capture all those primitives we've talked about. We do have extensions going on where we have more complicated interaction. But right now, yeah, this is the only way the test uploads agents. The test and the user can interact in the clear, plain text, uh, you know, down below here, OK? And uh, so let me just give you an you know, example so that you, you know, even before I define security or anything, let me tell you what this ideal world looks like. What are the agents? So here's an example of functional encryption, say public key functional encryption. So the test can upload two kinds of agents, key agents and ciphertext agents. What is a key agent? It's a particular program, There's, well, except one parameter can be specified, which is a function sitting inside the key agent. And ciphertext agent is also a you know, well-defined single program, but there's one parameter you can specify, which is a message. Okay, so as soon as the test uploads these agents, the user gets handles for them. User can upload its own uh, agents, but since it's, it's, since it's a public key setting, it can upload its own ciphertext agents, uh, but it cannot generate its own key agents. And then the user can request a session between the ciphertext agent and the key agent. And in functional encryption, these agents work exactly in this way. You put them together in a session, the ciphertext agent will send its message over to the key agent, the key agent will apply the function on it and output it. Okay. Uh, so you know that is that's what uh, the ideal agents uh, do, and um, the output of this session will be given back to the user. The user only has handles to these agents, and then it puts them in a session and it gets the output. In more general um, uh, agents, so here the user didn't specify any input in the session, but more generally it could also specify inputs for each of these agents if they are agents that take inputs, like an in obfuscation. And, okay, so this thing that I just described, the ideal, you know, what happens in the ideal world, the specification of the key agent and cybertext agent, that is the schema. So if you're on functional encryption schema, you know, you specify that this is the behavior of key agent, this is the behavior of ciphertext agent. You need to also specify the following. So, so you, basically you specify two families of agents, uh, which we call P test and P user. P, I don't know what, in a program family or something. It's, a, it's an agent family. Um, so the P test in this case can, consists of both key agents and ciphertext agent. P user only consists of ciphertext agents. Um, and um, you know these agents, as I said, as mentioned earlier, they're, it's a single program. An agent family is basically a single program in which you can feed in one parameter, which will define its behavior. Okay. Um, so, so far I've only defined, you know, what a schema looks like. I didn't say anything about security, okay? So here is our security notion, which is you know, one that I'm saying doesn't use simulation. It's called int pre for indistinguishability preserving security. And it's in the spirit of obfuscation, if you, you know, uh, see it, you know, that's the closest that, uh, uh, that has this flavor of definition. So before I define this security notion, I define a property about tests. Okay? So I'll call a test 
I say that a test is hiding with respect to a schema sigma, if no user in the ideal world can distinguish whether the test, okay, I didn't show it so far, the test gets a bit as an input. And it cannot distinguish between the test getting bit b equal to 0 and b equal to 1. Okay, so it outputs a bit b prime, and the b prime is essentially independent of b. If that is the case for every user, then we say that the test is hiding in this ideal world. Okay. It's just a definition. No. And some tests are obviously not hiding. They might just send their bit b to the user. Some tests are obviously hiding because they don't use their bits b. There will be other tests which are interesting. They will use the bit b in an interesting way, and still they will be hiding. In the real world, um, in, if, if it was an honest user, of course, it will run the program e. But in a, in a there is no telling what it's going to do with what the agents it receives, with the objects it receives. Uh, but the, you know, we could ask for a similar hiding requirement in this setting. We'll say that a test is hiding with respect to O, with the objectifying algorithm, if no adversary in the real world can distinguish between B equal to 0 and B equal to 1. And the security get requirement is that if uh, you know, so we'll say an, a scheme OE is in pretty secure for a schema sigma if, this is the security part of the argument, uh, definition, if the test is, you know, for every test that is hiding in the ideal world, it should remain hiding in the real world. Okay? If that is the case, then I say my scheme is secure. I'll also need, uh, you know, the correctness requirement and some efficiency and compactness, which are all what you would expect. Okay, but the main kind of uh, non-trivial security requirement is this, that uh, if, if a test, for every test that is hiding in the ideal world, it should remain hiding in the real world, where instead of the ideal functionality, you use the objectifying algorithm. So any questions on this? Because you know, that's pretty much all that the framework is, and everything else is about studying this. Yeah. You say for every user or something like that, it's for every polynomial time user? Yeah, good point, yes. Uh, for most part, I'm going to be interested only in everything here being polynomial time. So the test, the user, the adversary, they're all polynomial time. And even the schemas are, you know, the agents in the schema are polynomial time. Okay. Yeah. The uh, schema defines O or E or? What's that again? Schema defines the algorithm O and E, or they? The, uh, the schema doesn't define. Schema only defines the agents. A scheme, we wanted to confuse you most. So, this, you know, a scheme is O comma E, which is a pair of, it's an implementation of the schema. They require to be stateless, or they can also be interactive? Good point. They're, so, I, since for lack of time, I'm skipping a lot of things about, you know, state, they, they're required to be stateless, essentially, except for this issue of, you know, if it's something like functional encryption, you'd want the key to be around. So we allow a setup phase in which some state can be generated and it'll be available to O and D throughout. But other than that, every time an agent comes up, O doesn't have any state from previous invocations. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, any other questions? <coughs> OK, so let me give you a, an example. So I actually already gave you one example, which is functional encryption. Let me show you another example so that I can give you more details about the uh, framework. Okay, so obfuscation. It's very simple schema. Uh, it has just one kind of agents, the agents which hold a program inside them. And only the, the test and the user can both upload them. There is no uh, particular agent that only the test can upload them. Okay, so auth means authorized agents which only the test can upload them. You know, think, think of things like keys. There is nothing like that in obfuscation. Okay? And what is this kind of agent that everybody can upload? Well, it has a program inside it as a parameter. And this is an agent, when you run it in a session, it runs by itself. It doesn't want to talk to anyone. But it does take an input x, and it outputs the program executed on x. Okay? That will be the definition of, that will be the schema of obfuscation. Now, that's a very nice definition of obfuscation. So I know it's too good to be true. Um, you know, could we achieve, you know, we know VBB obfuscation is impossible. Could we get this uh, security definition for uh, obfuscation? Or is there an impossibility result? 
Unfortunately, even though it's not BBB security, even though there is no you know, simulation going on here, this particular uh, schema turns out to be something you cannot realize as I stated. Okay. Can, you, can you explain more intuitively how is that the definition weaker than BBB security? Because your definition, there's no simulation, but it's kind of like simulation. Yeah, if you so here, yeah, technically it's equ as impossible as BBB security, so there is no you know, distinction, right? So this is also impossible, that's also impossible, okay? However, that's if you are asking for security against every polynomial time test, okay? But maybe we don't have to do that, okay? So that brings me to this notion of test families. So it's seemingly weaker, but they are both impossible, so they are the same. They are the same. But I have some leverage here to weaken, you know, some knob I can turn to try and get weaker security definitions. And that knob is the choice of the test family. Okay? So, so far, test was arbitrary polynomial time machines. What is a test? It's some machine which takes a bit B. It also interacts with the user, and it also uploads uh, agents which are either going to the ideal world or to the object, right? the objectifying algorithm. Right? So it doesn't know which one it is. So that's, that's what a test is. Now, I could put some arbitrary constraints on tests, what kind of tests I'm interested in. And let me call that, you know, gamma is a test family. And then everything, you know, that we are defining, you can just extend to this gamma. You'll say, okay, you know, in pre-security, instead of having to hold against every test, every polynomial time test, it needs to only hold for every test in this family. Okay? So, so that's what we're going to do to salvage you know, to the possibility of uh, obfuscation okay, and other primitives. Okay? So a primitive is specified not just by the schema, but also the test family against which you want security to work. Okay? Uh, and there are many interesting test families we you know, have been coming across. We talk about test families which are deterministic or which are you know, uh, uh, various things which will make sense for different primitives. But one test family which does uh, make sense for many primitives is this test family that we call delta. It has a structural requirement. Maybe I'll just briefly tell you what delta does. It has an arbitrary part at the bottom which interacts with the user arbitrarily, but this part doesn't get the bit B. Okay? Then how does, it use, how does the test use B? Well, every time this test wants to upload an agent, it is required to produce two agents. Could be the same, could be different. But both those agents get reported to the, so agents are plain text objects, right? You know, the program with the parameter. That gets reported to the user. And then one of those agents gets chosen by the bit B and sent upstairs. Okay. So this is a very useful kind of test family which you know, shows up in a few different places at least. Can you explain it? I didn't get the, what is the, this, uh, of the test? Okay. Um, so it has an arbitrary part which interacts with the user arbitrarily, polynomial time, okay? Uh, but it doesn't see the bit B itself, okay? So its behavior is independent of B. And every time it wants to upload a, uh, an agent, it actually has to generate two agents, could be the same, but two, two agents, both of which get reported to the user. So this thing, it's copied over to the user. But only one of them will be chosen using this bit B. So if B is zero, you choose A zero and upload that. No restriction on the A zero and A one, they could be anything? They could be anything that are, that's within the family, yeah, the test family, oh. schema. Oh, okay. These are these agents are in the schema, I mean, are allowed by the schema, right? Agents allowed by the schema. Do you think somehow go wrong if the, the test isn't required to tell the user what he uploaded? Yes, um, for you know, to get things like, um, say, differing input sophistication and so forth, you have the flavor of the user knowing both circuits, and that's what's going on here. Okay. So this bottom thing is the sampler in some sense? That the... It is a sampler, that's a good point. So for obfuscation, you know of this part as a sampler. Okay. Um, Okay, so that is delta without any you know, uh, uh, adornments, but we have a bunch of variants of delta. So delta star is a family in which it's like delta, but this bottom part doesn't read any message from the user. It only speaks, okay? So it can give auxiliary information, but it's not going to listen to the user. Delta double star doesn't even do that. It just uh, you know, doesn't direct either way with the user. 
uh, delta deterministic, where it doesn't at this point matter whether it's delta or arbitrary. It's, it's deterministic, uh, doesn't flip in a random coin. So you could also define things like delta public coin, where it can flip coins, but they are known to the, um, known to the user. Okay. Oh, you can't give any extra messages. Here, there is no interaction. And in the first one, you can give other messages. You can give an auxiliary information, yeah. So if you instantiate this for the same schema that I talked about, the obfuscation schema, and you ask for in-pre-security, um, it turns out you, know, you need to do a little bit of, uh, kind of uh, syntactic adjustments. But you can show that these definitions are equivalent to the definitions of, so if you require a deterministic test, if you restrict your deterministic test, well, then the only, you know, you see A0A1, and uh, maybe it's also important to say here, we are looking at users being non-uniform. So if there, you know, if there is a test who produces functionally unequal or functionally different um, programs, there is some test who can distinguish it, right? So, so delta deterministic, uh, the hiding tests are the ones who always upload the same functionally equal, equivalent program. So that turns out to be the same as indistinguishable obfuscation. Delta double star is basically different inputs obfuscation, but without auxiliary information. This guy is, gives a different inputs obfuscation you know, with auxiliary input. And this one is an even stronger uh, notion of obfuscation. We call it adaptive different inputs obfuscation. It turns out this was also defined in a paper um, involving, oops, um, Hong Cheng and others, um, you know, for whatever some other construction they wanted. Oh, it keeps going here. So let me actually also show you this. Uh, so another example, uh, unless you have a question on the previous one. Yeah. Um, so the, these uh, characterizations are elegant in the sense that it's compact. But uh, if I, if, if the only thing I knew about the uh, obfuscation are these tests, I would have no idea of what this thing means. Sure. Um, these, uh, you know, this kind of gives you some other sense of security than um, it doesn't tell you how to use them, right? In fact, you know, if, if your world only consisted of deterministic procedures producing um, uh, office, you know, programs of that will be obfuscated for you, maybe you'll be happy with this, uh, you know, with uh, I/O in the sense that whenever a program is produced. You cannot. You obfuscation doesn't need to hide it because somebody out there is going to be able to figure it out. Figure it out. Okay. So our notion of security is limiting. It's not like you see security. All it says is that if no adversary could have figured out this distinction in the ideal world, I don't want anybody to figure it out in the real world. So um, I/O, you know, does give you some sort of security guarantee if you're working only with tests which are, you know, deterministic. I don't know if that answers your question. This, I'm hoping that there's a more high-level definition than I/O itself, but in this case, it's very close. Okay, but if I had arbitrary PPT tests, then probably you have a better sense of security here. That you know, no matter uh, you know what what do people want from obfuscation, if nobody in the ideal world could, have, you want it to be like the ideal world. How do you define like the ideal world? Instead of saying you can simulate whatever happens in the real world and the ideal world, we are saying, if some bit of information, unfortunately just a single bit or a constant number of bits, of information was going to be hidden in the ideal world, rest assured it'll stay hidden in the real world. Okay, that's the only guarantee we are giving. It doesn't, yeah, it's certainly not simulation. The whole point is it's not simulation. Okay, any other questions? And you could also define, you know, for, for if other, you want to tweak the definition, I don't know, if you want to public coin DA and so forth, you don't need to change the definition of obfuscation itself or the framework. All you need to say is what is the new test family you are interested in. So, if there is an adversary who breaks the real world protocol, then you will construct an adversary in the ideal world who will break the protocol. You're asking how would you prove something is secure? That will be one way to prove. Another way to prove is to maybe you know give explicit characterizations of what does it mean to be ideal hiding and then just you know, uh, do something more explicit. So 
The reason I was so one thing I was trying to understand is how is it different from the simulation based definition? Mm -hmm. And one explanation could be that the, you are not it's not computational in this case. Okay. It is a adversary which succeeds in maybe less probability but related Um So there's a gap in between how, how much uh, uh, how successful we are yeah, so if you define success as being able to predict this bit, that uh, yeah, then that's what you're saying. If you if you're not going to be successful in the real world, then you're not successful. In the ideal world, then you won't be successful in the real. World. How much? Okay, that's very little time. So I'm going to skip over some of the couple of examples. I'll stop here to show you function uh, FHE, where you don't. Um, the agents can update their state. Uh, the only reason I'm showing you this is to show that agents are stateful. Okay, and, you know you can read the uh, paper for more details. There's a paper at Eurocrep with the basic definition. Let me tell you one more, inter a couple of more interesting things in the time I have. One is the notion of reduction. Okay, so basically, you can have a construction in an in a hybrid world. So you are already given some. Uh, ideal functionality, or not functionality, ideal schema, sigma star, and you want to build a scheme for another schema, sigma, well, that's what it would look like okay, in our framework. Uh, and we call it reducing sigma to sigma star using this uh, scheme. We, we require a simulation-based definition because we can. You know, most of the times, if you are already in an ideal world, you, know, you can give simulation-based security definitions. So we just you know, require that. We don't really need this for uh, for whatever purpose we define reduction for, and the purpose we define reduction for is the composition. If you have a reduction from sigma to sigma star, and if you have a scheme for sigma star, which is this O star E star, we can put them together in the most natural way, and the composed scheme will be a secure scheme according to our definition. Well, they are better than me. <laughs> uh, Okay, that seems to work. Um, and composition theorem, as it is stated here, only works for the full-fledged in pre-security, which means you have to consider all test family, all polynomial time tests. But if you want to work with a restricted test family, you will need a better notion of reduction, which has additional requirements. We have such a notion of reduction for a few. Um, uh, you know, classes like delta and delta star for which we can again prove a composition theorem. And I'll just point out one thing, which is uh, uh, speaks to a question that Yuval was asking yesterday, that is there a notion of obfuscation you could use in a where natural constructions would, you know, work, you don't have to go through a lot of puncturing and so forth, and still it's not known to be impossible, okay? So delta uh, in pre is such a notion, it's stronger than you know, for obfuscation, it's stronger than DIO, so there are impossibility results. But as far as we know so far, there's no impossibility result. Okay, so here is a construction for FE based on such a notion of obfuscation. So the simplest thing you could imagine, you want to, you know, uh, op create a key agent, the algorithm is just to put a signature on it. And you want to create a ciphertext agent, the um, algorithm, given that you have obfuscation, is to upload a you know, to obfuscate the following program. What does the program do? It'll verify a signature, and if the signature signature on the function, if it's good, runs a function on it, on the message and returns it. Okay, this in fact is similar to a construction uh, by you know uh, Boyle et al. Uh, from last year, except they needed something more complicated than just signatures because they were not using. Uh, our, you know, this delta in pre-secure um, obfuscation, but only delta star, which is this obfuscation. One other thing in that spirit, okay, uh, is, okay, there's an, I'll just rush through this. There's another construction, which is for function hiding functional encryption, which is similar. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. And I'll just mention that there's some new work where we have theorem which extends a result of um, uh, uh, Bitansky et al. Um, and actually it shows that it's not, it was not a result, it was a result about obfuscation of two kinds, but it turns out it's not a result about obfuscation per se, it is a, it's a result that holds for all schemas. Okay? Um, and it kind of, we can clean up the proof a little bit also. All right, so you know, you a new framework and hopefully you have use for it. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.